purpose today is more importantly to just let you know, you know, what is going on, what some of the things we at the National Pork Producers Council are doing, and more importantly as it relates to the, the challenges that we face. First of all, just not taking anything for assumption, the industry has two organizations. Of course, the National Pork Board, which is our checkoff organization, our sister organization, which is challenged with working on issues related to demand, consumer education, research, and producer education. NPPC deals with uh, issues related to regulation, legislation, developing market opportunities in the international, especially as it relates to market access. Once we gain market access, then how do we keep these markets open? Sadly enough, most of the time here lately is being spent in the third area, which is called protecting your livelihood, that is, or code for the freedom to operate, the challenges that our industry is facing from many of our external factors, which we will talk about. Uh, and lastly, uh, in, in our We Care initiative, which is our social responsibility initiative that really demonstrates what the pork industry is doing and telling our story uh, about the great uh, work that our producers are doing. So I think it's, it only start. I start off here lately in talking about this in, from a comprehensive approach. Oftentimes we look at these things in the context of a specific request, uh, whether it be legislation or regulation um, or activist agenda, you know, such as the challenges that we had lately with HSUS and the others. And the purpose of my talk today is the fact that says all of this has to be a comprehensive approach that we have to be working on all of these. Uh, many speakers use the analogy of a three-legged stool, oftentimes you hear. Uh, I use the analogy of four legs to a table is much more sturdy than a, a stool. And that if you're not doing all of these things here that we list out, uh, you leave yourself open to uh, potential threats. And so we're going to go through each of these specifically. Let's talk first and foremost about producer accountability. Um, that today is more prominent than ever before to demonstrate we're doing the right thing. Um, as we're testifying in front of Congress or having House Ag Committees and having uh, reports giving on the job that it's doing, it's really important in today to not have surprises. We all see the demise of politicians when a film comes up or a documentary or something, what that they've said that really kind of flies in the face of, you know, what it is that they stand for. Uh, most recently, we've seen our news dominated by one of the most prominent athletes uh, in the world with Lance Armstrong and, and what that's happened and what we refer to as brand hypocrisy. You say one thing and yet you're doing something else. And so we have to make sure that we truly are working towards that. And so five years ago, we launched a program called the We Care Initiative. Most of you have a lanyard around your neck that talks about that, that kind of demonstrates what it is that our commitment is on all of these fronts, whether it's in animal care, environment, food safety, health, giving back to the community. These are the fundamentals that, that we first and foremost stand on. Most of these come naturally. Within that, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to speak this morning, which some of you may have been there at the Hormel meeting, where the next evolution of this process is moving into a verification of proving what it is that, that we do. Sadly, I spend most of my time today in front of, and we'll talk about this later, but in front of our customers in the boardrooms meeting with sustainability officers, uh, vice presidents of public relations and marketing, people that historically we haven't engaged with. Most of the time our time has been spent with procurement managers, buyers, and the marketing people within these organizations, and these social pressures that's coming into bear, they have lots of questions about what it is we're doing. And so this principles, practices, proof model in the We Care is our approach to kind of demonstrating the pork industry's commitment to doing the right thing. That starts off, first of all, with a shared principle, the fact that says, we believe, you know, this is the right things to do. Not because we've been mandated to it, but because... Fundamentally, that's where farmers, ranchers, and producers come from. But we do need to have a set of practices that we all buy into, that we agree to, like PQA+, Plus, like TQA, and those kinds of things. And we found the need for more of this, as we've seen through undercover videos, 
that we have the responsibility to make sure our people understand the importance of this. So that means establishing expectations. And as we move into that, now we have the burden of proof, which says, okay, that sounds great, but demonstrate that you're actually doing it. And so that comes through the case of the certification of our people, our farm workers through TQA+, setting the expectation. On farm assessments that come from the fact of somebody, whether it be your veterinarian, the extension person, whoever that's working with you that comes to the farm, that helps you understand in a different set of eyes of the things that you may not be aware of, and so that works through it. We've recently put into place uh, a panel of experts, which we refer to as our animal care review panel, which is there that in the event the third party can say something about an undercover video that gives confidence or some type of proof to our customers that when they're exposed to a video of what they do can say and do about it. So that's kind of the model that we operate in today's environment. I will tell you, you should take great pride from the pork industry. We're held up all the time as example in comparison to the other species groups that you know we're far ahead of them in embodying this process and having all of our producers engage in it. The next area that we spend a significant amount of our time and our primary goal is in protecting the freedom to operate. This primarily deals with legislative and regulatory issues. NPPC is charged with you know, both helping the states and, and from the national level of making sure that the industry is not exposed to undue burden, legislation, and regulation. So with that, let's just talk about it a little bit. Much of the time here lately has been dominated by, for example, what we refer to now as the HSUS UEP agreement. This has stimulated lots of controversy within the barnyard. Uh, MPPC has led the efforts in opposing this. And a lot of people ask the question, why, why are you in opposition to this? This is something that deals with, with egg layers. and producers. If they want to do that, and we're in total agreement, if the egg industry wants to do something in concert with, in this case, HSUS, that's great. But once you bring it into legislation, that's a very slippery slope because what it sets in place is the expectation that other species groups should do it. And personally, we're just not in favor of bringing government to the farm level. And for us, you have to understand what it's really about is way more than just, in this case, cage sizes or uh, confinement area for, for animals or birds in this case. There's many other aspects to it that deals with very strict specification on the farm related to ammonia level, labeling of product, testing, doing inspections, third-party audits, all of these things that ultimately lend themselves to be very prescriptive. And so we spent a lot of time opposing that, uh, and this brought a lot of attention to the swine industry. MPPC is leading that effort, you know, in that, that, af in that aspect and continue to do so. Uh, as I said, for our viewpoint, if it's about a choice, if an entity wants to do a cooperative effort, that's great. We're just not in agreement that it should be imposed on all farmers, producers in this case, uh, as what would become in this case a legislative piece. The other area that we're continue to spend more and more of our time on, you know, and it's hard not to, you know, if you pick up a newspaper, uh, you hear the issue in relationship to antibiotics. Uh, we hear about antibiotic resistance. Here recently we saw the consumers reports did a piece on really a scare tactic of you know really challenging the fact that the animal industry and the meat industry is primarily responsible for much of the uh, antibiotic resistance that, that occurs today. Uh, and to be brutally honest, most of it is just not factual. We have to understand first and foremost we already have we are the most regulated industry there is out there from the standpoint that we already have to comply with FDA regulations for any drug approval. All of our product that is sold goes through the Animal Plant and the Health Inspection Service, the residue testing that goes on there. So there is checks and balances to assure that our meat is safe, which we all know it is. And more importantly in this case, it really sets in place this whole motion again about restrictions. And so our concerns, we have what we've called a DUFA, which is the Animal Drug User Fee Act, is reauthorized this year. 
And it authorizes FDA to collect fees to renew animal drugs in it. Our concerns in this, with the new reporting requirements that's coming out with this new administration in Congress, is going to be on feed mills that mix antibiotics and feed. It's going to be much more prescriptive than that. Uh, we know that many of our congressional districts is pushing this, much of it in cooperation with activist groups such as the Pew Commission, uh, Consumers Union, where they're wanting to collect data and measure it all across the board of where the product is used, how it's used on specific drugs, and then having to keep records for all of this, we just believe is, is not necessary. Obviously, the Farm Bill is a big issue that we're dealing with. It's made national news and discussion. Uh, to be honest in this case, Farm Bill, it really should be called a food bill because 90% you know, of this stuff really deals with the reauthorization of most of our food programs, whether they be associated with school lunch programs, uh, welfare, all of that. Very small percentage of the Farm Bill is dollars really deals with what I would refer to as issues related to farms. But the one thing that we did support in the Farm Bill, and we're very adamant about getting it reapproved in the fact of a new comprehensive surveillance system for pork, that's what that means is testing for uh, animal diseases that, that might be, especially as it relates to foreign animal disease. A catastrophic event insurance program, what this would mean that today with our industry shipping nearly 30% of our product, what would happen in the event of a foreign animal disease hit? You know, what kind of insurance program might we have available for help protect? Reduction in the CRP to address the feed availability issue. Uh, increase in swine research because we've seen the erosion of our, our uh, research funding at our land-grant institutions. Uh, the need for continued foreign market development and market access programs because the future of our industry depends upon the growth of exports and the need for continued to support U.S. pork in the world, and the need for more uh, funding for uh, feral swine eradication efforts because, again, that's one of the key uh, areas of concern that we have is that continues to grow and it poses a significant health risk. Uh, some things that we opposed in the Farm Bill is, you know, no need for any more livestock titles in there, uh, again, getting more prescriptive in what it is that we need to be doing, opposing the egg bill, uh, antibiotic ban. And one of the concerning things that we see more and more, uh, you know, because the government purchase program through what they refer to as Section 32 funds, where you see bonus buys occur at a time frame when the marketplace needs it and programs for school lunch uh, and programs for food aid programs, many of our uh, activist friends are calling on our government to say, look, if you're going to put these programs in place, then you should make them prescriptive in nature, such as for all the product that's purchased by the government, there should be very specific animal welfare guidelines. They should have things like all product purchased by the government should come from gestation, stall-free product, that kind of stuff. And the reality of that uh, is when that was approved, it was done intently not to show favor to any segment of the market, uh, under Section 32, it was based on a commodity program that lifts all categories, so not being prescriptive in it um, was the way it was designed. As some of you may know, we're also working heavily within USDA with their animal welfare practices. We're continuing to see more challenges at our plant levels uh, through the addition of animal welfare inspectors at our plants, and as a net result, we can continue to see incidents increasing of plant suspensions. All of a sudden, because of an issue that may have occurred with one animal, whether it be with a transporter unloading an animal, whether it be an animal that didn't effectively get stunned, uh, whatever the issue may be, uh, we seeing our plants shut down. And as a net result of that, we see what they may have be concerned about on one animal welfare issue of one pig putting five, six, seven, ten thousand 10,000 pigs at risk because we got pigs on the trucks and it's we've got trucks running around outside we're trying to keep them cool. And so we're continuing to work with them in regards to that, of tracking that data, talking about it, more importantly as it relates to a better decision tree process that we can put into place. So all of, regardless of whether it's our producers, our truckers, 
uh, or the plan operations understand the rules of the game because currently with this new addition that we have seen with FSIS in the past two years really of this real focus on animal welfare issues, uh, we're quite concerned about it because we're, we've got more prescriptive as it relates to these plant suspicion, suspensions uh, related to animal welfare issues almost than food safety because it appears as though we're more harsh in our efforts uh, if there's some type of incident that occurs on those versus something that, that may relate to food safety. So we're continuing to work with them that. I had a meeting here two weeks ago with FSIS, which is the Food Safety Inspection Service, about this. They recognize uh, hopefully we'll begin to see some improvements in that. One of the things we just, uh, in the cooperation with AMI, which is American Meat Institute, it took uh, Temple Grandin in to create a training video of proper unloading of animals, the proper use of instruments such as rattle paddles and other things of how we can unload pigs so that at least everybody understands, uh, both the inspectors and our transporters, you know, what's acceptable and what we can uh, expect from uh, them in the future. So <clears throat> marketplace engagement, this is what I get asked most about as it relates to uh, my efforts as a, from MPPC. I spend a lot of time in meeting uh, with these companies and talk to them about the questions they have about our industry and, and the uh, concerns. Uh, the, I mean, there's no question, you know, for us, times have changed dramatically of how we used to produce animals and how we do it today. We need to do a better job of being in and talking to these individuals about you know, we've done a great job of promoting our product. Now we have to do a better job of what I would call how we produce our product uh, and setting the expectations. It's a very frustrating time for you as producers because we're seeing all of this information that's being uh, shared that's out there uh, and pressure being applied to our customers uh, in regards to the need for enforcement and changing our production practices. But I will tell you it's also a frustrating time for our customers because, you know, I've had a number of them say, look, we just want to sell more pork, but yet we're being asked to make decisions on these issues, and we need to understand better what is going on. Most of that, I mean, it's a conundrum because from our viewpoint, pork is, is having great uh, increases. Our demand is great. As you well know, bacon is popular everywhere. We're seeing... Pork is at a very good position because of the high price of beef right now. We're seeing more feature activity both at the retail and the food service arena. Uh, so from that perspective, demand is, is really good. But yet, if you look over a timeline of the past 18 months or so, never have we seen more bad press, negative stories, things that are going on and challenges to us uh, in regards to that. Most of these are about removing choices. And for us, as MPPC, that's what our argument is, is the fact that says, you know, we're about choice. If producer wants to produce whatever, antibiotic-free, breed-specific, something in relationship to uh, uh, housing equation, that's great. We just don't want it forced on all of ours. So the question you ask is, well, okay, what's driving this? I mean, what, why... Why are we seeing all this activity that's occurring right now? Is it really out there that's because we're seeing a vegan agenda? And the stark reality is no. I mean, that number of what I would consider to be, you know, vegetarians or that is about the same as it's always been. We monitor that every year. It's a very small percentage of the marketplace. Yes, in general, we see a moderation in overall from the consuming public that they're eating less meat. But a lot of that's just due to a change in the lifestyle, the price of the products and that. But it's not about moving away from, from meat or putting that on. What it really comes from, as you all know, is the advent of the social media. This is not exclusive to us. It happens to the politicians. It happens everywhere in the world. With the advent of social media, whether it be Facebook, YouTube, you name it, significant amount of pressure can be brought to bear in a short period of time that these companies can all of a sudden get 500,000 signatures. They can have their websites attacked. They can have their email system attacked. They can get all of these calls that's coming in, you know, all of a sudden that they haven't had to deal with. 
and they just don't know how to handle it. And so as a net result of that, you get oftentimes knee-jerk reaction or pressure. They just want to do business, and therefore they make some uh, decisions that ultimately uh, is going to impact the industry. Primarily, they're driven by three negative topic areas. This overall continued agenda, what I would refer to as this passion against factory farms, anything big is bad, and therefore how do you attack into that overall area and, and use it. Uh, this kind of concern about food and health, using it as a marketing position and creating news about that. And then obviously this can, whole issue related to sustainability and green, all of these play into these areas that kind of want to paint a bad picture of agriculture. The predominant groups that are behind this, most of you know these, PETA, of course, HSUS, Mercy for Animals, uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Food and Water Watch, uh, all of these have kind of become very effective at using all these social tools and creating it. It is not, and you will ask these customers, our customers that are the food service retail, whoever, are you hearing it from your customers that shop at your store? Are they coming in and asking this? And the reality of the equation is no. That's not the point. It's really driven by the, these groups. And what they've discovered is it's much more effective to go after this kind of middle area, which in the middle area being the brands being, in this case, whether it be the Packers, um, the key brands such as McDonald's or whoever, uh, and the policymakers, because those decisions impact a significant amount more uh, people. And so it's very expensive to reach the consumer. And more importantly, consumers in general today don't really care, I mean, until they're engaged in it. And it costs a significant amount of money. But if you can get, in this case, one of our channel partners, to make a decision, it puts pressure back on the chain and now ultimately will ultimately impact uh, the consuming side of the equation. We've seen a significant number of announcements that's taken place in the last year related to a specific topic of sow housing uh, that's gone on. The thing I want to point out is most of these announcements have really not been very prescriptive at all. They don't have specifics in them. They don't have deadlines or that. And there's a few here that come into play on this. But the vast majority of them are unclear in what they really say, and they're nonspecific on their announcements. They just say, we want to work with our suppliers to head in this direction. They're going to formulate plans. They're going to uh, shift away from. They're working with their suppliers, all of which are just kind of what I call a get-out-of-jail card because it releases the pressure. They move on to the next. So it sends a very unclear message to the industry of, A, what it is you really want. Uh, more importantly, B, are you willing to pay for it? Because unlike many of the previous things that our industries had to deal with, for example, in the early 90s when we were moving to uh, what I would call a payment for lien program, there was an incentive. You got paid a payment, a premium for it. As a net result, the marketplace responded because customers paid more for it. Consumers ultimately paid more for it, and it sent a signal to the industry to work on that. All of this in code means there's no simple solution to this. When we're having our discussions with customers in this is, first and foremost, is to demonstrate our commitment to animal welfare. The programs we have in place that we can stand behind, we talk to them about the potential impact that this has on sustainability, because the pork industry has done carbon footprint analysis, we can show them this. We can show them improvement that we've made over the years in the reduction in water, the increase in our output, you know, the increase in, uh, the decrease in our feed usage, all of which is a positive story. But more importantly, the supply chain management. We have a very complex system today that sequences, you know, our product coming in and simply making these announcements without being in concert with the chain is, would be like telling one of our customers, or I use this a lot with our retailers, it would be like their marketing department saying, okay, whatever, a holiday is coming up. Let's pick a, an example. July the 4th because it's a big weekend for pork. You got a marketing guy all of a sudden determined that says, we're going to run a feature ad and we're going to put pork loins on the feature ad for 99 cents a pound. And they run the ad. 
and they haven't told their supply chain, in this case their procurement department, about it. And so the procurement department now has got the responsibility of lining it all up. And guess what? He hasn't got enough bought, more, and for sure he don't have it bought at the price that he needs, or he can't meet the expectations for it. That's our example that we say here is that, look, sit down and talk with us and understand where the industry is at, where we're going forward as it meets to it. Because the fear in all of this is if you make these announcements, at some point there's a day of reckoning, and this is what we call brand reputation, uh, meaning the fact if you make a statement and then you don't live up to it, it sets in motion this brand hypocrisy that says you're going to be called on it because we know our opposition in this case will be back saying that you said you were going to do this and simply saying, well, we'd buy more if it was available isn't enough of an answer. So our challenge is as a two-pronged approach. We're in defense of choice. Uh, this isn't about right or wrong. We have a lot of people who want to make this argument about black and white or right or wrong. It's not the issue. We have producers, I have board members that have, in this case, for example, on Sow Housing, ha having an alternative system to stalls. And they do fine. And then we have producers on the, it's not about the argument of one is better than the other. It's about defensive choice. Because we all know that in this case, in this world, it's about the caregiver. It's about the operation. Just as though we have producers out there today who produce, uh, have pasture lots or whatever. It's not about that there's a right system. But we do have to do a better job in changing the dynamic of in talking to our customers. Um, this kind of air of don't ask, don't tell is not over. We've gone through complete um, what I would refer to as a, a vulnerability assessment of what are the things that our industry might be posed, you know, to be uh, to challenge, such as pain management in the, in the form of castration, uh, tail docking, and those kind of things, the use of antibiotics, the use of uh, beta agonists. In, in, there's a variety and sundry of things that we need to explain the rationale of why we're doing them. And we shouldn't be afraid of that. And then we should have a set of agreed upon parameters and how it's done so that we can explain to them. And then we have, we're in the process now of doing what I would call message testing so that we can take to our customers, here's messages that we've tested with consuming public that help them better understand why it is that we do. And so that's kind of where we're at now, but it is a change in the culture of, you know, someone saying, don't, you know, don't ever bring that up. I'll give you a great example. Many of all of these customers that have made announcements regarding, for example, on sow housing, in their announcements they say things like, we've made a commitment to move away from uh, gestation stalls. And so they're saying we are going to have a 100% gestation stall free product. And you ask them, do you, I said, okay, do you understand that even considering all of the states that's passed a ballot initiative, all of the companies, in this case firms, that's made public announcements on their company-owned operations, that they all still use gestation stalls. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, well, last time I looked, gestation length is pretty well defined. Uh, it's 114 days last time I looked. And the majority of all of these still use stalls until the sows are confirmed pregnant. So that means for at least a third of their gestation, they're using them. So your statement, by definition, says you can't use those. And they're like, well, no one told us that. I said, well, that's the point. You need to be discussing this because you're putting out bad information. And more importantly, there is predominantly zero percent, not zero, a small percentage of product that's available today that really would classify as gestation stall free. So the point I'm trying to get at is we have to be better at gaining comprehension of these issues because these people that's making these decisions today from our customers are no different than their consuming public. 
They're so far removed of where the, their food comes from that all they're doing is applying to pressure. So that's part of our work is, is working with them. Um, and so our ask in this case is, first of all, work with us that have a common mission and goal. Last time I looked, food service and retail are dependent upon selling stuff. We are dependent upon producing the stuff you want to sell. So we have a common goal in, in that effect, that we want to help you sell more meat, and as a net result, we benefit because of it. And then we want <clears throat> the fact that says, okay, if you're really interested in this thing, help us in the fact of investing more in research to finding out better solutions if there are a need for those. Be opening to listening to producers. If there's one thing, and there's one thing that I encourage all producers to be engaged in this, is be ready to participate in the conversation uh, by those that be affected by the decisions. Do your due diligence. Evaluate the economic impact, scientific, consumer, and environment impact, all of which those studies have been done, and that's in the process that we're sharing now. And then at the end of the day, consider the long-term agenda of the animal rights activists. What do we here? If you only have to look at what happened in England and that, that says, look, um, the EU is reeling from the impacts of some of this work. They're having trouble meeting the expectations of their supply on their meat program, not to mention they're having a serious economic deficit. And producers gaining access to capital in order to comply with it is very difficult. And so as a net result, it's a very slippery slope that you result in a food deficit program if you're not careful. So this all gets back to this commitment of this comprehensive approach that says, you know, we just can't focus on one thing. Uh, we've done a very good job, you know, since the 90s of demonstrating our commitment to the environment. Uh, and we're working into the animal care, food safety, community relations, public health. All these things go together that the pork industry should take a great pride of. We just finished our uh, first uh, sustainability report. If And these are available. You can get them through us or the uh, pork board. Uh, which really demonstrates and quantifies all the great things that the pork industry is doing. And we share these reports with, because we're calling on the sustainability officer, and these are the guys that like this stuff. And it's one kind of a one-stop shop that can, they, they can access that material on. Secondly, we developed a website which we're directing all of our people to that says, you want to hear about the pork industry story of what we're doing from real producers you know, we direct them to the porkcares.org. This is where we send our customers to to find out information if you've got questions on any of these areas that are out there. Uh, the other thing that I would just wanted to hit on, and you heard in there, I serve on the U.S. Farm and Ranch Alliance Board, which is a group of industry associations that's come together, pork, beef, uh, dairy, uh, grain, corn, soybean, all of it, to really tell the story you know, that we all sit around and talk about the need to educate the consuming public. Well, we finally kind of decided to come together in it. And with that, uh, I'm proud to say we, you know, making an impact. We've done a variety of things like what I call food dialogues, which we actually go into the lion's den, if you would, and invite the opposition in to have panel discussions. We, in Los Angeles, going into the heart of where we see all the movie producers and all of that and sit down with them and, and met with movie producers and all that and talking about where their food comes from and having a dialogue. We just had one in New York. This is one on antibiotics. I don't know if anybody ever watches CNN on Sunday morning, but uh, that guy in the middle is Ali Valshi. He is the chief correspondent for uh, business for CNN, did a marvelous job. But here the point being is we invited in a pediatrician, you know, very respected pediatrician, uh, in this case a pediatric nutrition from um, the uh, Albert Einstein School of Medicine. We had Christine Hong from the DVM from uh, the uh, AVMA. And there's one of our local producers from here in Iowa will sit on that. But more importantly, this uh, Gene Halloran is the director of food policy for Consumer Union is the key person that's driving this whole antibiotic discussion. And we just sit down for two hours and debated back and forth of what does science actually say. More importantly, this was streamed live, and we had about 200 people in the audience, which is media writers, uh, food influencers, that we're exposing it to, people that would never hear our story, uh, which is a step in the right direction. 
I'd encourage anyone, if you want to go to Food Dialogues, can, this is where you can see all this and what's taking place. More importantly there, there's places where we deposit all of our information. You want a question on animal welfare, biotech, food choices, growth hormones, pesticides, all of this area is one place. So it's not only pork, it's beef, it's all the other areas that we put our information there and the answers questions from them. One of the things that we recognize is the need for more what I would call uh, disciples or spokespeople. We had a contest. We had 125 producers from across the U.S. submitted uh, into this competition. Uh, these here that you see are the nine finalists for the Faces of Farming. These are the individuals who will become the professional spokespeople for our industry that go out and we pitch them all the time. We pitch them for the Oprah show. We pitch them for uh, death side visits in New York, L.A. We pitch them to any place that they want to go to tell our story. The thing that I wanted to bring up in this case that you should take great pride in, out of 120-some uh, competition, we have two pork producers. There's four finalists. Uh, Chris Chin from Missouri and Bo Stone from North Carolina was chosen uh, to be spokespeople on behalf of U.S. Farm and Ranch Alliance, which is really good for us because now, in addition to telling the bigger overall story of agriculture and where your food comes from, we've got two pork producers who are very qualified to do it. Next, I just say <clears throat> everybody knows about Food Inc., everybody knows about these movies that come out. Uh, we are launching a major documentary that will be, uh, <coughs> that will come out in uh, next year, in a year from now, February 2014, which is a film really about this whole process of where your food comes from and talking about the impact of technology and all the great things that agriculture is doing uh, to work on that. So, And lastly, obviously, we need to continue to work on exposing the activist agenda. Uh, we're working very diligently on that behind the scenes and looking at all this stuff in cooperation with a number of other firms that are out there that have this agenda. But again, I say, while that is important, if you're just simply against something, um, and not for something, it fairly quickly wears thin on the public. So you have to make sure that you have all the background, and then at that same time, we're going to be very aggressive at taking on our opposition uh, in that regard and exposing their agenda. So to give you an idea of the challenge that we face, how many people in here are aware of this uh, current challenge that's got going on? Has anybody seen this? This is alive and well. It's out there. There's petitions being signed every day on this to try to get people to ban dihydrogen monoxide. This is the, uh, this is the ingredient uh, that, if you ingest it wrongly, will kill you. Uh, this is the major carrier of all pesticides. This is the major carrier of most of the chemicals that it's used out there. And invariably, Every time they do these, they get an 85% sign-up, that people sign up for this to ban this. This kind of demonstrates the challenge that we face. Does everybody know what dihydrogen monoxide is? It's water. This gets at the point I'm trying to get at it, the fact that says, in today's world, I mean, if you can put stuff together in the context of, you know, most of our consuming public don't go very far into searching out the truth. And so we have to be more aggressive at getting information out there and fighting this because we send, I mean, these mixed signals that, that people buy into and no one really ever asks, What's, what, what do you gain? Who's behind us? What's the benefit of this? What are, the, what are the things that would result as a result of this? You know, what are the unintended consequences? This is very similar to the email. Everybody knows if this is my computer, you would see on the screen up there on the home page, usually some dead animal hanging because I'm an avid hunter. So our family eats a lot of uh, different wildlife. But I consider myself an avid uh, outdoorsman and an avid uh, conservationist as well. But I received this letter that kind of states what I'm getting at in this case of be careful of who it is that's asking the question and what they're trying to get. 
this letter predominantly is sent to me saying that um, they want to ban, um, in this case, fox hunting in Colorado. And so the point being in this is, who is it that is behind the agenda at hand? Um, and that's the challenge we have and why it is it's so important for us to work on exposing the, the activist agenda.